Okay, welcome to Pathophysiology Lecture on Fluid Electrolytes, Acid-Base Imbalances, and also Cancer. But uh, in this first video, I'm going to break it up for just fluids and electrolytes. We're not going to do the acid bases um, at this point. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started here and talk about the normal body fluid distribution as in where does your water go, okay? Total body water, or all the water that's in your body, is going to consist of everything intracellular, as in inside your cells, and extracellular fluid, everything outside your cells. Intracellular fluid is two-thirds of all your total body water. That's where most of your water is, two-thirds, okay? Your extracellular fluid consists of everything else. Okay, so we have interstitial fluid, as in the fluid in between the cells, interstitial, between cells. You have intravascular fluid, so that's fluid that's in between or inside your blood system, okay? Not actually in your blood cells, but again, inside your blood system or bloodstream. And miscellaneous, you have lymph has fluid in it, in your lymph system, your cerebral spinal fluid, sweat has fluid, urine has fluid, synovial fluid like inside your joints and that sort of thing, okay? So uh, what is edema, okay? That's the big question here. Edema itself is basically having excess fluid in any or all of those places. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, edema, you have excess fluid maybe in the cells, interstitial space between the cells, or serous cavities. And serous cavities are your spaces around your organs, so that's where you could have other parts of edema. Okay, so let's look at this picture here is a foot with edema in it. Okay, so you can see where if you press in that, it'll kind of like leave a thumbprint in there. It's, it's obviously very swollen up, so it has edema. You can see the little, from whatever uh, bruising that you have there. Okay, some kind of injury, no doubt. All right, when we're talking about um, edema, flow of water, things like that, we kind of have to get a little bit into the osmotic and hydrostatic pressures. But this first part, what I want you to know about this is, is I want you to memorize or keep this picture in your head as we go through this whole part about fluids and, and that sort of thing because it all kind of comes back to this. If you look at that, this is an artery turning into a vein at the capillary level, so where you can, one red blood cell can get through there at the time. So your red blood cell from your artery is bringing in the oxygen, dropping it off in your tissues your red blood cells is dropping off the nutrients in your tissues, okay? And then when it's dropped that off, then the carbon dioxide, okay, will, will jump back into your cells on the venous side or the vein side, and the waste will jump in and it's all flushed out, okay? But kind of keep this thing in perspective as we go through this because uh, what we'll see is if you block this or your pressures are pushing out too hard, or pressures are not pushing back, that sort of thing, or pulling, okay? So we'll look at the hydrostatic and osmotic pressures in a minute here when we talk about that. But for now, let's look at edema, okay? Again, edema is just excess or excessive accumulation of fluid inside your cells or your interstitial spaces or serous cavities around organs, okay? So it could be localized. So you have a trauma around an organ, like pulmonary edema, or the ankle that we saw. Okay, so pulmonary edema, you have water in your lungs. Okay, you've heard of that before. Uh, maybe you have generalized edema. Okay, that is from something like congestive heart failure. Well, CHF, congestive heart failure. Wow, that's really blurry. Focus, focus, okay. Congestive heart failure, um, and uh, what you have there is a big floppy heart, and your big floppy heart is not going to be able to function like it should, pushing out, getting the pressures that you need. Again, back to that picture that we saw, and uh, the pressures from your, or the lack of pressures from your big floppy heart is going to obviously make it so that fluid can get stuck in places it shouldn't be stuck, okay? And, uh, so what do we have? Different reasons for edema. We got venous obstruction right here. 
Okay, you can see where that increases capillary hydrostatic pressure as N. Again, if we have our little uh, blood vessel right here, and uh, hydrostatic pressure is like pushing things out. Okay, so if you have a obstruction over here on the venous side, then that's going to create a back pressure, and that back pressure is going to make it so that you are using your hydrostatic pressure and pushing things out of the bloodstream into the tissues. Okay, does that make sense? The other thing we have here is maybe you're getting edema because of loss of albumin. Okay, if you remember, albumin is your major protein, okay, in your blood. So if you have these proteins in your blood, remember proteins are stuff, what I like to call stuff. If you have this stuff, these proteins in your blood, and you lose some of them, then what you're going to do is you're going to lose water too, okay? Because remember, osmosis, you know, you're constantly wanting to have the water chase stuff. Normally we think about salts, but any stuff will do, and proteins are big stuffs, okay? So if you have less of these in here, then you'll have less water attracted to them so that you'll have the water out here in the tissues where you don't want it, okay? So uh, that's another one. So increase in capillary permeability. Obviously, if you have holes in your capillary walls here, then you're going to have things leaking out into the tissues, which shouldn't be leaking out into the tissues, and that kind of just makes sense, right? Uh, your book looks at these or in your, in your book, but you're also your uh, lecture notes, which by the way, you should be reading, even though I'm doing these videos, you should be reading your lecture notes, and they kind of break it up a little bit. So they'll break it up into increased movement out of a vascular structure, like for venous obstruction. Um, they'll look at decreased movement back into venous structures, okay, which would be like our loss of albumin, okay. Um, so it just says out or in. Um, what else we got here? Okay, let's move on. Electrolytes. Okay, you have electrolytes. Uh, what are electrolytes? Well, electrolytes are your major component in fluid balance. Why? Because they're stuff. Okay, so some electrolytes. Anything that carries a charge is electro, okay, carries a charge. So potassium would have a charge, right? Uh, sodium would have a charge on it. Uh, chloride would have a charge on it, even though it's a negative. Okay, they tend to go together, so in chloride. Uh, bicarb has a charge on it. Okay, so these are, again, they're electrolytes, they're things that you'll see thrown into Gatorade to replace your electrolytes. Just look on the bottle and you'll see a lot of what they are, okay? All right, so now let's look at uh, osmotic pressure. Okay, osmotic pressure, uh, it says here, draws water, okay? Um, well, again, osmotic, as in osmosis, is going to draw water, right? Mm -hmm. Because depending on what kind of stuff you have in your blood stream or in your tissues, you are going to obviously draw uh, water chasing it. Okay, so that's what that is. Um, you also have oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure, again, is, there's a big thing in your book if you would like to read that. I, uh, I don't want to get into all the different pressure gradients and things, but that's what that's really doing. The oncotic pressure is just measuring the differences across the membrane on how much goes in, how much comes out. Mr. Right. Mark, please cross okay. at the 5973. Mr. Mark, 5973. Okay, is when I have pushes water, okay? So, uh, oops, I didn't want to go on that yet. Hydrostatic pressure, okay? That's why I have this pump, by the way. It's a hydraulic pump. So the hydraulic pump will push up your car or push water back in to your cell or into your bloodstream. Okay, so here's my, again, my little thing here. Uh, I am pushing water out, 
or I'm pushing water in, where I tend to think of oncotic because onco is like cancer and cancer sucks, as it says here. Okay, so that would be the one, you know, sucking them back in or sucking it back out. Okay, again, don't get too caught up with that. Uh, the whole point is you have pressures going in, pressures coming out, they have to be equalized, and, and that keeps the flow going. Okay? Okay. Uh, let's review the blood a little bit. Um, actually, before we get to that, uh, no, let's, let's review the blood. That's a good place to do that. Um, plasma. Okay, plasma is what? The liquid portion of blood, not counting uh, the cells. Okay, makes sense. We said that. Made up of water, made up of proteins, uh, things in the plasma, made up of fats, okay, in your plasma. Electrolytes, things with a charge. Hormones, gases, nutrients, waste, okay, so we have all this, all of these things that are in your um, blood, as we like to refer to it, that is, is all over the place and I'm losing it again. Wow, this thing does not like to stay focused. Okay, so we have waste. Let's talk about the waste a little bit here, okay? You have, if I get out of the way, I think it focuses, right? Uh, not really. Kind of have to give it something to focus on, okay? Um, if I, looking at my waist, okay? Uh, here's one, bun. You ever heard of, of measuring somebody's bun? Uh, blood, urea, nitrogen is what that says, if you can't see it, okay? Um, from br urea breakdown of proteins, you'll see that. Creatinine, another waste that you find in your, in your blood, okay? Breakdown of creatine phosphate. You've heard of creatine phosphate. A lot of people take that when they're bodybuilding or wanting a lot of energy. Again, that will show you if you measure it um, in the urine about you know, what kind of concentration of it you have, what you're breaking down, how much waste products you have in your blood, and that'll tell you whether you're breaking down muscle too, okay? Your creatinine will also tell you if you have kidney damage on, of course, anything in here. Okay, uric acid. Uric acid is another one. Again, it's made, uh, not made, but urine is made from it. So uh, that's something that if you're breaking down your amino acids, especially your purines, then you'll see that there. And of course there is Bilirubin, which bilirubin is breakdown of blood. Okay, you hear that typically with jaundice and, and, and neonatal babies. Okay, um, what else do I got to say about that? Not really much. Okay, ascites is a unusual, or, or not unusual, well, hopefully it's unusual, a specific kind of uh, edema, okay? So ascites is edema, except that you'll see this ascites um, in people that are starving, for example. Okay, you see this like in the, um, the little tele, what do you call those, the telecommercials or the, or the, the fundraising things. I, I'm blanking right now. But anyway, you see these where you have people that are starving, but they've got this huge, huge belly. Okay, well, it's not because they have a whole bunch of food, it's actually completely the opposite because they don't have food, so therefore you get protein containing, uh, or you get accumulation of protein containing fluid in the peritoneal space or in between where all your organs and everything are, you get a bunch of fluid in there. Again, it's from that same reason where you're looking at your capillary, right? And if you don't have a bunch of proteins in here, then what you're going to do is have it in places where you shouldn't have it because you're starving, all your water is going to chase that stuff or those proteins and therefore you get it in between where it's supposed to be and you basically got a whole, huge whole belly of water that has proteins in it, okay? but. It's not really doing you much good. It really needs to be in your bloodstream so it can get to where it needs to go. But unfortunately, that's not happening. It's called ascites. Okay. Um, okay. Oops. Also, portal hyperten hypertension is what that says. That just means that you have a again. It's a 
backflow when you're talking about in your portal vein or in your liver. Okay, so you, you see that a lot in, in hepatitis, things like that. Okay, let's look at uh, hormones regulating fluid balance. Okay, hopefully these are at least partially review for you. Okay, antidiuretic hormone, right? ADH, what's um, Antidiuretic hormone, that means it's anti and diuretic. Okay, so let me go and, and put my little kidney up here. That's how I draw my kidney nephron. Okay, that's my kidney nephron, my glomerulus. Everything's kind of coming in from the bloodstream, goes and gets filtered, runs down here. This is my uh, collecting duct and then out into the urine, okay? Well, I have an antidiuretic hormone, okay? If my antidiuretic hormone, that's what that says, ADH, um, what it does is it keeps me from diuresing or having diuresis, which is urinating a lot of water. So it specifically goes and grabs water right out of the collecting tubule and shoves it right back into your bloodstream. Okay, now oh, here's your bloodstream. So now I got a bunch of water in my bloodstream up here instead of being excreted. Okay, so that will decrease your water loss and put it back in your blood. Antidiuretic hormone. Aldosterone does kind of the same thing. So aldosterone, again, in the same area here, um, will go ahead and it doesn't do water per se, but it will take and throw sodium back into your bloodstream. And as it does it, it gets rid of a potassium on its way. Okay? So aldosterone will do that effect of if it takes sodium and puts it back in your blood, it's going to have water chase sodium. So you really have the same effect where. It's like antidiuretic hormone in that sense, where you have the uh, water being back in your bloodstream, okay? Let's look at ANP and BNP, atrial natriuretic peptide, okay? The natri, by the way, is N-A, like sodium, okay? So what is it doing? Atrial natriuretic peptide will do the same thing with um, BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. Like this says, it's made in the atria of the heart. So we're looking at the heart here, okay, where atrial natriuretic peptide hormone is being made. And if you look here on this little chart, ANP and BNP, well, what do they do? They do a couple of things. Um, one, they're going to increase your glomerular filtration rate. They're going to decrease renin, and they're going to cause vasodilation. Okay, so all these three things at the same time is what they're doing. Okay, now what do we, let's start with renin, for example. Renin is made to increase blood pressure, okay? Well, if we're decreasing renin, we're decreasing blood pressure, okay? So what's happening here is somehow our blood pressure got too high in our heart, in the atrium, notice that, and kicked out the ANP, and by the way, BNP, which is also made in the heart. They just never changed it from brain natriuretic peptide when they figured out it was also made in the heart. But, so what's happening is your heart sensed that there was too much blood in your system, okay? Or too much blood pressure, at least. It went kick kicked these things out to ultimately decrease your blood pressure by decreasing aldosterone, which was up here, and decrease in angiotensin II and causing natriuresis, as in kicking sodium out of your body, okay? So it's decreasing blood pressure, decreasing blood volume um, by a couple different ways. The one we're kind of focusing on right here is you're getting rid of sodium, you're, that, which means water's chasing it out of the body, and you're decreasing your blood volume, okay, through that little mechanism. Kind of make sense? I hope so. Okay. All right. I already said that. Okay. A and P and B and P. Uh, what are they doing? Again, they're stimulating the renal excretion of sodium. That's all that's saying. And we got that down. Okay. 
let's do a little quick review of the blood pressure. If you were paying attention, hopefully you can get these. Okay, so what do we do if we increase our aldosterone? Okay, well, let's think about that. We increase aldosterone, are we increasing or decreasing blood pressure? Okay, um, I'm going to draw my little thing right here again, my little capillary, okay, and that capillary is going to be right on top of my kidney tubule, drawn all over this thing, okay, my kidney tubule right there. So my aldosterone did what? It came from somewhere around here and it took sodium out of that distal convoluted tubule collecting duct. It took sodium out and put it back in your blood. Okay, so what would that do? More sodium means more water is going to chase it, which means your blood pressure increases. Got it? Make sense on that? All right, let's look at antidiuretic hormone. Does that increase or decrease your blood pressure? Antidiuretic hormone, again, it's sitting out here in this area too, and your antidiuretic hormone will actually take the water itself and take it right out of that tubule and also shove it back in. So now you got water in your blood, and if you have water in your blood, then you have water, and it's going to increase your blood pressure. You don't need it to chase the sodium because you're directly with ADH, directly putting the water in your blood anyway. Okay. Okay. What about ANP and BNP? If you increase ANP, what does it do? Um, if you cre increase BNP, what does it do? Clue, they do the same thing and it's opposite, okay? So what they're really gonna do is decrease renin, and renin increase blood pressure like these did. So if you decrease the renin, then you're decreasing your blood pressure. What did I just do? Uh, technology, okay? And that's where we are. Okay, let's start looking at some of these uh, electrolytes. We'll start with sodium. Okay, there's the <coughs> typical how much we find in your blood. Okay, so again, I might as well draw my little blood thing. I'll be using it, of course. I always do. Okay, that's how much sodium you find in your bloodstream when we measure it because we stick a needle in your blood. Okay, that's where we measure it from. Major cation outside of the cell. Alrighty. So, if we're looking at the cell, whatever, sodium is the major cation outside the cell. Again, a cation is positive, anions are negative, just for a review on that, okay? Major cation outside of the cell is sodium. All right, um, <clears throat> what else we have? What else is sodium doing? It's gonna maintain your extracellular fluid osmotic balance because it is major cation outside of the cell. Focus, thank you. Okay, oh really? Okay, so the major um, cation outside, water again chases the sodium, that's why it's maintaining your osmotic balance outside of your cell, okay? Okay, what else is you? What, sodium, we remember sodium, right? That's that thing that has to do with our, our resting membrane potential. Do you remember that? Our RMP, where you had the like negative 90 microvolts, and then when it started to depolarize a cell or go into the positive area, that part going up was sodium, right? Okay, so we're going to see that sodium, uh, one of its major functions here is to deal with that resting membrane potential in excitable tissues. What are excitable tissues? Muscles are excitable tissues, and uh, of course heart is an excitable tissue. So are nervous, okay? So uh, think about that, keep that in mind, that it, excitable tissues, if it's you know muscles, both skeletal and cardiac, and then nervous tissue, 
then let's think about what if you have too much or too little of sodium. You know, what's that going to do? And we'll get to that in a minute, okay? Let's look at some organs involved and hormones that are involved, okay? Again, the kidney, we already saw where sodium is, is uh, maintained by the kidney. The adrenal gland, that's where aldosterone is made, for an example. Um, the heart, the natriuretic peptides were made there, okay? That's kind of what it says right here. All right? Um, what that says is most often goes hand in hand with chloride. You kind of knew that, sodium chloride, they kind of go together. Sodium's positive, okay? And uh, chloride is negative, okay? So again, we have hyponatremia. Again, hypo, not enough of, hyper, too much of, na, or natri, as in an A, so it has to do with sodium, and eme, of course, is in your blood, okay? So we got hyponatremia, hypernatremia. Uh, we said it's 135 and 145, so less than 135 is going to be hypo, more than 147 is going to be hyper, okay? Causes of having not enough sodium. Okay, this kind of makes sense, right? You can lose it by extra kidney or extra renal causes, as your note says. Okay, so things like vomiting and diarrhea, okay? Or of course you can use it, lose it, you know, inside your kidneys like diuresis or diuretics, okay? Um, of course you can have an inadequate intake, as your notes say, or decrease sodium in your diet. Not typically a problem in the U.S., but who knows? Some people do have that problem. Okay, how else? Prolonged sweating, okay. Hi. Um, total body water increases more than sodium, like exercising with water and intake and no uh, sodium intake, okay? So this is, this is the one where you're gonna get with people exercising, doing marathons, things that are really, really long, but they're only drinking pure water and not adding in the electrolytes that they walk lost and everything through sweat and you know, prolonged sweating, hopefully not vomiting diarrhea, but I have seen that, okay? So let's look at uh, the kidney again, heart, liver dysfunction, you can get not enough sodium in your body, okay? Now these signs and symptoms right here, uh, we'll get that to that in a second here. I wanna do them kind of together with the hypernatremia causes, all right? So let's look at hypernatremia as in too much salt or too much sodium, sorry, I do that all the time. People do that all the time. Sodium is a salt, okay? We just tend to think of it as the salt. Too much sodium, over secretion of aldosterone, okay? If we over secrete aldosterone, we're gonna pull too much sodium back into the bloodstream, and therefore you have too much. That makes sense. Cushing's disease will do that. Or maybe you even uh, increase dietary sodium, duh. That's pretty prevalent in the U.S., I would say. We always have too much salt in our diets. I have no exception to that. Okay? Too little water, as in not getting enough water. Of course, if you're here in Arizona, it's 8,000 degrees in the summer. That's a big problem. But for everybody else, you tend to see it a lot in elderly that don't get enough water and infants, okay, that uh, need a lot of water that sometimes they don't get it. Okay, there's a thing called diabetes insipidus. We'll go over that in more detail later. But basically, what diabetes insipidus, it has nothing to do with the diabetes that you're used to, okay? What you're used to with diabetes is diabetes mellitus or diabetes mellitus, however you want to say it. That is different. You have diabetes mellitus type 1, type 2, and then gestational. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with that. Don't get it confused because diabetes insipidus is specifically for decreased ADH, okay? We already saw that. Decreased antidiuretic hormone, if you don't have enough antidiuretic, double negative there, then you have diabetes insipidus, and we'll look at that in a second, okay? So what are the signs and symptoms for 
hypernatremia and hyponatremia, okay? Let's kind of look at them here, compare a little bit back and forth. Okay, so if you have um, too much sodium, of course you're going to get thirsty. You're going to want to balance that out osmotically, right? So you're going to want to drink a lot of water to, to balance it out. So you're going to get thirsty. Um, duh, you're going to get dry mucous membranes because of the same reason, okay? You're going to get restless. Why are you going to get restless? Well, because remember that sodium had to do with your uh, action potential and your muscle contraction, that sort of thing, okay? You're going to get restless because of that, if you have too much of it. Oliguria, as in low output of urine, okay? So you're not getting enough output of your urine because you have too much sodium. Too much sodium is sucking that water right back in, therefore you're not urinating it out. Duh, that makes sense, right? Tachycardia is what that said before I messed it up. Um, add it to that. Seem to have lost my eraser capability. Anyway, tachycardia is a really fast heart rate. Again, that action potential, the same reason you're getting this. Muscle twitching, the same reason you're getting tachycardia. Again, that action potential. Okay, hyperreflexia, again, same thing as muscle twitching and tachycardia, and restlessness, and convulsions. Again, the same reason, okay? So these are all pretty much the same. You don't have to memorize them. It drives you crazy if you start memorizing all this stuff, so just go ahead and think about it, okay? Too much sodium. These are the things sodium's involved in. That's what I really want you to know out of this class, okay? Because then you can think about stuff and you don't have to memorize everything, okay? Look at the other part of it. Not enough sodium. Same reason as the action potential. Now you can't run that action potential, so you're going to get lethargic and get really tired. Okay? Headaches. Not really sure why. Uh, think about that one. Maybe it has to do with confusion because confusion makes sense because, again, the brain is an excitable tissue, the neurons that are run by sodium. Okay? So it may have something to do with that. Restlessness, irritability, it shows up on both of these. Okay, so it's going to, too much or too little sodium will cause that. And these make sense. Muscle weakness, because you can't twitch your muscle, that action potential um, spazzes it down, it can't relax it. And of course, coma, if everything stops. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's look at diabetes insipidus or what we said earlier was the lack of antidiuretic hormone, okay? Again, let's kind of draw my little kidney thing back up here again, diabetes insipidus. That was a really bad looking one, but there you have it. Okay, lack of ADH, so antidiuretic hormone, ADH takes ADH and puts water back in your blood. So my water is going back in my blood. But if I don't have that, that's not happening. Okay? That makes sense? So I'm not getting water back in my blood, I'm getting water urinated out because I don't have ADH. Okay? Diabetes insipidus. Reason they has any relation at all to do with the other kind of diabetes mellitus that we've heard about is just because you're urinating in both cases, okay? Really the only thing other than that, completely different animals, okay? How do you get diabetes insipidus? Again, the lack of ADH, well, ADH, if you remember, is made in the pituitary, okay? So maybe you've got a pituitary issue going on there. Uh, of course, maybe your renal tubules are just not reacting correctly to ADH, so nephrogenic, um, psychogenic, maybe you're a psycho, no, that's maybe because of something in your mind, you are drinking way too much water. Well, if you're drinking way too much water, you don't need any more in there, use it or lose it, you shut the whole system down, it won't work if you're constantly drinking way too much water, okay? Interesting. Signs and symptoms, duh, okay? You're urinating like crazy, you're gonna be really thirsty because you don't have a lot of water in there, okay? That's all that means. Polyuria, many urines.
polydipsnia. Dipsia. Not dipsnia. That's not dizia either. That's wrong. Polydipsnia. Dipsia. Sorry. Polydipsia. There should be a P right in here. Is many drinkings. Okay, so you're very thirsty. That's all that work for that, right? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Excrete large volume of dilute urine and get dehydrated. That makes sense. Okay, so how do we test that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, you're testing your serum osmolarity, as in how much stuff you have in your bloodstream, in your serum, um, versus how much stuff you have coming out of your urine. You should be in a, in a solute water ratio. If you don't have that correct ratio, you can tell there's something going on here. Okay, maybe it's ADH. And of course, you have your plasma ADH levels you can directly test, okay, in your blood plasma. Okay, let's move on to a totally different animal again. We call it SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH, okay? What that means is I like to think about it as water intoxication, okay? That's what I call it, water intox. Because you have so much ADH that you literally have water intoxicated yourself. Okay? So again, same kind of idea where you, uh, it's actually the exact opposite of diabetes insipidus. Okay? So again, our kidney tube, I don't want to have to draw that again way up here, but you get the point, I think. Now you have way too much ADH, which means you have way too much water in your blood. What would cause something like that to happen? Okay, well, we always have this one, idiopathic. Um, idio and pathic. So pathic, of course, we know already means a pathology, a disease. So some kind of disease, and we're idiots as far as how we get it. We don't know. Okay, that literally is where it came from. Idiopathic is from the same root word as idiot. We just don't know. Okay, that's unfortunately a lot of things in medicine is idiopathic. Okay, brain injury. Uh, sure, you can damage your pituitary, that makes sense. Um, how about uh, infections? Sure, that can mess up your kidney. Uh, that makes sense. Trauma, sure, you can damage your brain or your kidney. Uh, stroke, you could stroke it out and not get blood and therefore again damage to it. Hemorrhage, internal bleeding, sure, that, that kind of all makes sense, right? Um, this one is kind of weird, the ADH secreting tumor. Okay, we're talking about a bronchogenic cancer that secretes or makes ADH. What? ADH isn't made in the lungs where your bronchi are, but we have this weird bronchogenic tumor that actually um, makes ADH in your lungs. Okay, so that's kind of weird, kind of worth remembering just because it is bizarre. Okay. Uh, signs and symptoms, hyponatremia. Does that make sense? Well, I don't know, does it? If we don't, we have too much ADH. What's that have to do with water, though? Um, if we have too much ADH, then it's putting a ton of water in our blood. But this is saying you don't have that much salt or sodium in your blood. Well, you still have sodium in your blood, but now you have so much water that it's diluting all of that out. So it looks like we don't have sodium in our blood. Okay? Does that make sense? Because that's what we can measure. All right. Um, I need to stop this real fast and change my batteries.